Hello everyone. Today's video is going to be a little bit political, so proceed at your own risk. Every so often, I like to take a break from demonizing mega corporations and remind the people that have taken an interest in my content talking about the hardships in the workplace and the day-to-day -day struggle in capitalism of the end goal of my content, which is stressing the importance of class consciousness, make it clear why capitalism doesn't work for the working people, and argue the case for socialism. I understand that some people in my audience don't agree with where I stand, and that's fine. I understand that words like socialism and proletariat are dirty words in the world of of American politics, but I think a lot of the reason that people shy away from this alternative is that it has been demonized to death. I also understand that there are going to be people out there that call this a cope post, but it's not. It's letting people know what kind of lies they've been force-fed by their overlords. For over a century now, rightist propagandists have, or at least try to shun socialism as an unstable system, scare the working class out of the thought process, and have told so many lies and fabricated so much rumor and misinformation about socialism to the point that the common class, for the most part, are convinced that so Socialism is a system and ideology that has been tried and failed and proven disastrous for everyone that lived through it. And as a result, quote-unquote far-left politics such as socialism, communism, and anarchism is often held to the same standard as fascism and a national quote-unquote socialism, which that alone to me is completely ridiculous. How can stateless, classless anarchism be the same as totalitarian iron fist fascism? How can a dictatorship of the proletariat, as in a government controlled by the working class, be the same as an elitist autocracy? With the theme of this video being the exposure of rightist lies about socialism and what the truth is, I'm going to take a look at just a few talking points propagated by the right and further dispel the doubt and resentment that the American and Western working class in general holds towards the workers' ideology, the socialist alternative, and socialist leaders throughout history. As always, I'll try to show screenshots of my sources in the video and drop links to my sources in the description. To start, I want to go back to the Nazis' supposed link to socialism. I think we've all heard the argument a thousand times by now. The Nazis were socialists because it's in the name. Right-wingers absolutely love this argument, <laughs> and they love it because it's a projection. They don't really care if it makes sense, just as long as they can project themes of oppression, mass murder, and violence onto the left. And every time the right brings this up, leftists always have to respond with something along the lines of, are urinal cakes a type of confection just because it has the word cake in it? Because that's the same logic that right-wingers have used when trying to project national socialism onto actual fucking socialism. And this isn't me trying to argue that national socialism socialism isn't real socialism, or even that it's fake socialism. If anything, it's more like fascism trying to disguise itself as socialism. It's fascism that hides behind a thin veil of leftist language. The National Socialist German Workers' Party did have its roots in anti-capitalist political leanings, but this later became overtaken by reactionaries as the party sought out the support of big businesses, as well as the sympathy of the capitalist system developing in Germany at the time. A position that every socialist and communist theorist that acts in good faith to the workers' ideology has disagreed with. We do not want the sympathy of oligarchs, tyrants, and the bourgeoisie. The descent of the National Socialist German Workers' Party into right-wing political leanings continued until the party was not only openly anti-Marxist, but heavily racist and extremist, in particular blaming Jews and communists for Germany's extreme turmoil. Why the National Socialist German Workers' Party never decided to dump this name was neither the decision for German socialists outside the party to make, nor is it something that modern socialists today can do anything about. The best we can do is mock and abhor their misuse of the terms socialist and workers' party. The name of the Nazi party isn't even where the terms socialist or socialism originate. The name of the third chapter of the Communist Manifesto by Karl Marx and Frederick Engels is titled Socialist and Communist Literature, so to assume that the Nazis came up with the term socialism first, and that leftists have co-opted it is a flat-out lie that anyone can debunk rather easily. When Adolf Hitler first joined the party, he was working as a domestic spy for the new German government, and the president of Germany at the time was targeting communist communists in particular, and assigned Hitler to spy on the National Socialist German Workers' Party, only for Hitler himself to find that he agreed with the party's platform, which by then had become the anti-Marxist and anti-Semitic faction we all know and hate. And Hitler, agreeing with the Nazis deep down, ditched his spy job to pursue leadership within the Nazi party, and run for office. In an interview with Nazi sympathizer George Sylvester Wierich, he is quoted as having said, The Marxians have stolen the term and confused its meaning. I shall take socialism away from the socialists. He then goes on to state how his definition of socialism, at least, is an ancient Aryan-Germanic institution in which certain lands were held in common and that the demands of society must be met by the productive class based on race solidarity. And that's where we see that it was not communists, but Hitler and the Nazis that have stolen and confused the meaning of socialism. Even if Hitler truly believed in socialism, his racial sectionalism would still be seen as reactionary and severely out of touch with the socialist cause. To socialists, there is no racial solidarity or unity through nationality. Socialists, at least today, believe in intersectionality 
nationality and working class solidarity. There is no war but class war. Racism was condemned by socialists as early as 1913. While this quote isn't a condemnation of anti-Semitism in particular, Vladimir Lenin is quoting as having said, the emancipation of the American slaves took place in a less quote-unquote reformative manner than that of the Russian slaves. And shame on America for the plight of the Negroes. This of course being a time when the term Negro was still acceptable when referring to black people. Despite everything, today's socialists are especially targeted for having supposed anti-Semitic views due to their opposition of Zionism and the genocide against Palestinian Arabs committed by the Israeli settler state. Right-wingers label leftists as neo-Nazis for speaking out against Israel, a state which itself is the perpetrator of a genocide, and is closer in political leaning to the Nazis. Right-wingers also conveniently leave out the fact that Jews can also be anti-Zionist, and this has become evident as Israel continues to destroy Gaza and rape and kill the Arab population. The non-Jews whose only only way to defend Jews from anti-Semitism is by supporting Zionism and condemning Palestine, I would argue, are more anti-Semitic than anti-Zionist socialists. To socialists, anti-Zionism is a subset of anti-imperialism. The Israeli state is the direct result of European imperialism in the Middle East. The next segment is going to be surrounding the supposed death toll of socialism, and more specifically the Holodomor. We are constantly told that socialism killed 100 million people within a century, and it seems that this claim originated with the Black Book of Communism, which which is proven to have inflated numbers and even include Nazi soldiers that died on the Eastern Front of World War II, a war that the Nazis started as victims of communism. This whole claim that socialism killed hundreds of millions of people is most obviously a propaganda piece made to convince people that life under socialism would be worse than living under the control of the Nazis. But the 100 million figure seems like yet another projection, because didn't European colonizers kill over 100 million natives as they carved out the American continent? Claim whatever you want, but the Europeans purposely brought their diseases with them, invaded native territories, violently persecuted the natives, violated their land and culture, and forced them to either integrate or move further west and relegate them to a few reservations, most of them exceedingly small, where they now continue their existence purely at the mercy of the settler states. But onto the Holodomor in particular. This, as well as the Great Purge, are often painted as crimes against humanity committed by Joseph Stalin's government in the Soviet Union. These two bloodlettings, as well as the apparently harsh treatment of criminals in the gulags, supposedly cursed Joseph Stalin's name with a kill count of around 20 million. I want to preface this point by making it known that Hitler's Holocaust was completely intentional. The 6 million figure we're always presented with is an estimate of how many Jewish people were killed. If we took into account Soviet civilians and prisoners of war, Polish people, Serbians, disabled people, Romanis, Freemasons, Slovenians, homosexuals, Spanish Republicans, and Jehovah's Witnesses, that figure rises to about 17 million people, purposely killed by Hitler and the Nazis. And this is coming from Wikipedia. And again, all sources can be found in the description. Just research it yourself. With that being said, I'd like to read a message from the auto-moderator on the subreddit for the D program regarding the Holodomor. The D program, for those unaware, is a leftist podcast that I think you should go check out once you're done here. Marxists do not deny that a famine happened in the Soviet Union in 1932. In fact, even the Soviet archive confirms this. What we do contest is the idea that this famine was man-made, or that there was a genocide against the Ukrainian people. This idea of the subjugation of the Soviet Union's own people was developed by Nazi Germany in order to show the world the terror of the quote-unquote Jewish communists. Socialist Musings 2017 stops writing Nazi propaganda on Holodomor. There have been efforts by anti-communists and Ukrainian nationalists to frame the famine that happened in the USSR around 1932 and 1933 as the Holodomor, literally, to kill by starvation in Ukrainian. Framing it this way serves two purposes. One, it implies the famine mainly affected Ukraine. Two, it implies that there was intent or deliberate causation. This framing was used to drive a wedge between the Ukrainian SSR and the USSR. The argument goes that because it was intentional and because it mainly targeted Ukraine that it was therefore an act of genocide. However, However, both of these points are highly debatable. The first issue is that the famine affected the majority of the USSR, not just the UKSSR. Kazakhstan, for example, was hit harder per capita than Ukraine was. The emergence of the Holodomor in the 1980s as a historical narrative was bound up with post-Soviet Ukrainian nation-making that cannot be neatly separated from the legacy of Eastern European anti-Semitism or what historian Peter Novik calls Holocaust envy, the desire for victimized groups to enshrine their own Holocaust or Holocaust-like events 
event in the historical record. For many nationalists, this has entailed minimizing the Holocaust to elevate their own experiences of historical victimization as the supreme atrocity. The Ukrainian scholar Lobomir Lusiuk exemplified this view in his notorious remark that the Holodomor was a crime against humanity arguably without parallel in European history. Second issue. The second issue is that one of the main causes of the famine was crop failure due to weather and disease, which is hardly something anyone can control no matter their intentions. However, the famine may have been further exacerbated by the agricultural collectivization and rapid industrialization policies of the Soviet Union. However, if these policies had not been carried out, there could have been even more devastating consequences later. Necessity. In 1931, during a speech delivered at the first all-union conference of leading personnel of socialist industry, Stalin said, quote, we are 50 or 100 years behind the advanced countries. We must make good this distance in 10 years. Either we do it or we shall go under, unquote. In 1941, exactly 10 years later, the Nazis invaded the Soviet Union. By this time, the Soviet Union's industrialization program had led to the development of a large and powerful industrial base, which was essential to the Soviet war effort. This allowed the Soviet Union to produce large quantities of armaments, vehicles, and other military equipment, which was crucial in the fight against Nazi Germany. Additional resources will be in the description as usual. There's also an essay about the gulags, but with this point being specifically about the Holodomor, I'll have to save that for a different time. As passive-aggressive as Wikipedia is, according to their sources, the Soviet famine of 1932 and 1933 saw a low end of 5.7 million deaths and a high end of 8.7 million deaths. As for the Great Purge, between 700,000 and 1.2 million suspected counter-revolutionaries and Trotskyites, same difference, were executed, while more were either imprisoned or deported. Adding the highest numbers from the famine and the purge adds up to 9.9 million, or about 58% of Hitler's kill count. Considering that the famine was of no fault of Stalin or the Soviet government, or the concept of communism itself, that high end of 1.2 million doesn't make Stalin even a tenth as evil as Hitler, especially when we consider that the purge was only carried out to maintain peace and stability within the Soviet Union and prevent a counter-revolution. Had Leon Trotsky succeeded in leading a coup against Stalin, the ensuing civil war would lead to so many deaths that we would never hear the end of it. As if we hear the end of it as things turned out the way they did. But what can you do when we live in an age where people are so stubborn that the cold hard facts mean fuck all, and they constantly peddle the same tired arguments that have been debunked probably a hundred million times? Unfortunately, a lot of this propaganda gets repeated by people here on YouTube. One example being an attempt at explaining the absurdity of quote-unquote Holodomor denial, when the truth really isn't that hard to find. I'd say Holocaust denial is what's absurd, because they found the concentration camps, they found the crematorias, they found the gas chambers, they found the Zyklon B. They found the mass graves. They found so much damning shit. Whereas the Holodomor, all you have to do is take a deeper look at it to find out exactly what happened, as well as find a good reason as to why it did happen. As the message says, the Holodomor is just a name they gave the famine to make a particular demographic within the Soviet Union the victims of an atrocity supposedly worse than the Holocaust. The next segment is one that depresses me, and is one that I honestly didn't know how to counter until recently. There's a trigger warning for this next segment, as it has to do with sex crimes. So I understand if this is something you can't watch. I'll give you a quick second to click off. Okay. It's about the rape committed by Soviet soldiers heading into Western Europe at the end of World War II. Let me just say now that the topic of rape depresses me. The stories of survivors, the way survivors are treated in our society, the way women in general are treated in our society, the fact that convicted rapists are given a slap on the wrist compared to what they truly deserve, and the fact that some rapists are not only enabled but even rewarded for this sick and vile crime, it all makes me sick to my stomach. I personally know a few people that have been raped or sexually abused. One of my friends, a male, has been sexually abused in the past, and I just want to find the person that raped him and do not-so-nice things to them, let's just say. Anyway, I will not deny that rape was committed onto German civilians and in other areas liberated by the Soviet Union, mainly women, by Soviet forces at the end of World War II. I distinguish the monsters that raped their way to Western Europe from the liberators that came with the intention of destroying the Nazi regime and emancipating the proletariat in these countries. What particularly disgusted me is what we are told Stalin said about the supposedly rampant rape that occurred in these final days of the war. Wikipedia source 
source, at least, claims that Stalin told Yugoslav partisan Milovan Dilas that he should, quote, understand it if a soldier who has crossed thousands of kilometers through blood and fire and death has fun with a woman or takes some trifle, unquote. The source in question, a book by some Polish-American propagandist by the name of Anne Applebaum. In another quote, Stalin is quoted as saying, we lecture our soldiers too much, let them have their initiative. The source, another book by another Polish-American propagandist. Both of these books were written in the 2010s, about 70 years after the war had ended. I am in no way a rape apologist. To me, not only is rape the only crime that justifies the death penalty, but I think that ending the life of someone you can prove did rape should be legal. And also, in the perfect world where rapists are treated accordingly, their punishment should be carried out publicly, whether in the middle of the town square or broadcast live on TV. Let the world know that this is how you are to be treated if you violate another human being. And obviously, I'm not saying go out and start lynching rapists. Stay within the law. To quote someone that is themselves a sexual predator, stand back and stand by. But I'm no fool. You would think with how vehemently the Germans were told to hate communism that they would do everything to delegitimize the Soviet occupation and embarrass them on the world stage and keep some record that rape was legally sanctioned by the Soviet government. And surely after 80 years, something would be discovered by now to prove that it was. But maybe, just maybe, it wasn't legally sanctioned at all. So instead of looking at what propagandists say that Stalin said, why don't we take a look at what Stalin himself actually said? In doing so, let's take a look at the order of the day for January 19th, 1945. There unfortunately is no good source for this, as the link circled in red it no longer works, but the order reads, Officers and men of the Red Army, we are entering the country of the enemy. The remaining population in the liberated areas, regardless of whether they're German, Czech, or Polish, should not be subjected to violence. The perpetrators will be punished according to the laws of war. In the liberated territories, sexual relations with females are not allowed. Perpetrators of violence and rape will be shot. A second-hand source, which will be linked in the description, unfortunately had to be translated for this video, so we only get the gist of what former Soviet general Ivan Tretyak has to say. His statement reads, It would be hypocrisy to deny that cases of rape and other types of cruelty took place on German soil, but an attempt following Goebbels to present the Red Army as a horde of thugs and marauders does not correspond to historical truth and is blasphemous in relation to the memory of the liberating soldiers. In 1945, I was a regiment commander. Needless to say, we were very angry with the Germans. The Nazis burned my house and four other neighboring houses. They killed relatives and friends. There was perhaps not a single soldier in the regiment whose hands were not itching to avenge their relatives and friends. But there was an order from Stalin, and we carried it out. After all, then the army was much more disciplined than it is now. To be honest, I wanted revenge, but I would put anyone on trial who gave vent to this feeling and let go of his hands. There was not a single incident of violence in my regiment. Although, of course, in such a huge military group that entered Germany in 1945, anything could happen. The men had not seen the women for several years. Some couldn't resist. But today, many admit that sexual relations between our soldiers and German women were not always of a violent nature. There was also mutual interest. Another thing is unclear. Why do numerous foreign and Russian advocates for the purity of frontline morals not raise the question of the terrible and cruel violence on the part of the Germans, to which the peoples of the USSR were subjected during the war? And it's absolutely crazy that Bevor's Lampoon, translated into Russian, is published in huge editions in Russia. This is not pluralism, but the vilest cynicism, because the overwhelming majority of those slandered can no longer answer the liars. We can learn more about Joseph Goebbels' role in the exaggerating of wartime rape numbers committed by the Soviets from leading researcher at the Institute of Russian History, Professor Elena Senyevskaya. She states that it was Joseph Goebbels who first invented the idea that the Soviet Red Army was an army of barbaric rapists and murderers. He did this by simply accusing the Red Army of carrying out the Holocaust activities the Nazi German army had been routinely committing within the Soviet Union and throughout Eastern Europe. The Nazi German army, enthused as it was by racist rhetoric of its own superiority, carried out mass rapes of Soviet women and young girls as part of its demeaning of an inferior race. If the victims were not gang-raped to death or killed in some other equally hideous manner, the resulting pregnancies would ensure that the Slavic ethnicity would be replaced with at least partly Aryan offspring, making the Soviet population easier to control from a Nazi German point of view. Goebbels simply inverted the situation and incorrectly presented the marauding Nazi German army as liberators, and the self-sacrificing Red Army as brutish savages. The problem for the Nazi Germans had been that ordinary German people were beginning to go over to the advancing Red Army, seeing it as a liberator from Hitlerite oppression. In an attempt to counter this, Goebbels concocted the story that the Red Army had a policy of raping any girl or woman aged between 8 and 80. This scare tactic was designed to encourage the German 
civilian population to either fight the Red Army as it approached, or to retreat with the Nazi German Army as it was pushed back. And just so we know that I'm not just sourcing something convenient to the point I'm trying to make, here's Joseph Goebbels' own secretary admitting that fabricating stories and exaggerating numbers was not only encouraged, but routine. So there you have it. This is yet another projection and attempt to sully the reputation of the Red Army and of socialism and communism as a whole. And unfortunately, the liberal democracies have passed Goebbels' word on. While I can't say that falsely accusing someone of rape warrants the same punishment as rape itself, I can at least agree that falsely accusing someone of rape is a cruel thing to do, and is a supreme violation of trust, that I'm sure the accused could never forgive the accuser for. And I'll never be able to forgive neither the fascists for birthing such a blatant and horrible lie about the Red Army, nor will I be able to forgive the liberals for spreading this lie and passing it off as truth. I believed it for years, unfortunately, even after my process of radicalization had begun, and it continued to remain a grudge I held against the Soviet Union and of Joseph Stalin until fairly recently. But I know now that it was all a bunch of fascist bullshit. And now, so does the rest of the world, notwithstanding those that will continue to live in denial. Unfortunately, we see that Western capitalist nations are just as guilty as the fascists, seeing as how rape of Japanese women was enabled and rewarded during the final months of the Pacific Theater and during the occupation of Japan. The accounts are as disgusting as they are disturbing, and as much as I'd like to rip the Western allies to shreds, going over rape committed by the Western allies during the occupation of Japan could probably end up being its own video. And this video has gone on for long enough as it is. But I will say this, the only thing the Soviets did wrong is not rush the Japanese mainland after the 15th of August. I realize they probably had their hands full with Manchuria and Korea, but the Japanese people might have at least been safer under Soviet occupation. And honestly, it shocks me that the Japanese did not resent the West and embrace communism during the Cold War. There is a plethora of lies, fabricated stories, and misinformation against socialism, other leftist political ideologies, left-wing leaders and political figures, and movements that I did not get to address today, and more are being conjured up every single day. But I hope that by dispelling some of the largest, or at least the most malicious lies, I've been able to help educate some of my fellow proletarians and get people in the mindset that the capitalist propaganda machine is never to be trusted, even when they try to preach to you about the evils of communism. This is all part of their plan to keep the working class uneducated and obedient. So please, investigate the sources that I have linked to in the description and do your own research. It's all at your fingertips and the only price of admission is having an open mind. I came to the conclusion all on my own, with no outside influence, that life under capitalism is very similar to how they say life under communism would be like. I have learned a lot since then, and I still have a lot to learn. What better time to begin your own quest for the truth than during the year of the election? If you found this video informative, please give it a thumbs up and share the video with someone that needs to hear this. I also welcome any discourse in the comments below Low, given that you're not trying to reinforce any debunked claims or be malicious. Please also be sure to subscribe for more content like this as there will be more, and click the bell if you'd like to get notified as soon as I upload. Thank you for watching, and I'll be back soon with another video. Bye guys.